Great morning, everybody. Glad that you're here with us today. Uh, we are at a new place just this week, so next week, don't forget, we'll be back at Kahala Elementary. But, but while we're here, soak this in, because we do believe that God has a more permanent facility for us, a more permanent venue for us. And so get, get a picture of what that might look like. Although our team, I just want to acknowledge, man, our worship team and our setup team did a huge job of moving our children's ministry and everything else over here for this weekend. So, guys, you guys are strong. Thank you so much. Yeah, that man, you guys are awesome. Uh, we are in the end of a series called How to Live Through a Bad Day. How to Live Through a Bad Day. And I was, I was talking with my daughter uh, just a couple days ago as we were driving in the car, my wife and I were talking, and I don't know how we got on this conversation, but we started talking about having a baby. And so, you know, um, and, and as I'm explaining to her and talking about the actual process, she's asking her mom, hey, mom, how, was that, how difficult was that? And as mom explains, you know, my wife has had five, five children. Um, she, her eyes were getting big, and you could see the terror on her. So dad went into, you know, I got I to gotta help her context with this. And so I started describing how the, you know, the body changes, of course, and makes room for the baby. And there is purpose in the pain because you are giving birth to life. And in order to do that, there is this miracle that happens. This baby has to pass through your body. And so it is pain, but there's purpose in the pain. And she looked at me and said, I don't know if I can do that. It, it didn't register. However, when we know that there is purpose in our pain, it does help us. It gives us the strength we need to, to push through, pun intended, to push through the, the pain to do what needs to be done in the moment. If we know there's purpose in it, there is a portion of strength that we receive from it. And I want you to, to be assured that on the things that you go through, sometimes the purpose is so deeply buried in what we're going through, it's hard for us to believe that anything good can come of it. But there is purpose even in our moments of pain. This does not mean that God desires the moments of pain that we experience, but this does mean that even in the moments of pain, God is with us, he is bigger than them, and he can bring forth his purpose in them. And so today I want to look at one of the most pain-filled portions of Jesus' life. Um, and we, I want to talk about beginning from Palm Sunday because today is Palm Sunday. Today is the day where Jesus will make his triumphal entry into the city of Jerusalem. And the reason why we call it Palm Sunday is because the people who were expecting him brought palm branches and palm leaves and they put them down in his path as he came in riding on a donkey. And those palm leaves and palm branches, those were symbolic of triumph. There was a great anticipation of this Jesus who was coming into the city. And so they, they cried out, Hosanna, which means save now. And it's, it's not just a plea. It is, it's a confident declaration that we believe that you can save us, that you might be the one that God talked about. And so we're asking you to save us now. And so Jesus rides in with that kind of expectation from some of the people that were there that day. Uh, on Monday morning, he goes into the temple, and he notices, and the way that the temple was orchestrated, there was a portion of the temple that was reserved for those who were not Jewish to be able to come and to worship God, even if they weren't familiar with or a part of the Jewish community. And in that portion, there were people who were selling sacrifices. They were basically using the people's desire to sacrifice to God as a way to make money. And Jesus sees them taking up the only space that those who were not part of the Jewish community could come into. And he's ticked off because of their desire, their greed. They are taking up the space where the only place where Jewish and non-Jewish people could come and worship. And so he is so upset. He goes and he just starts to kick over the tables and basically cast them out and say, you know, you guys have turned my father's house. And he, he's been doing this often. He's been likening everything that God does with himself. And there's a reason why, because Jesus and God, he was saying, are one and the same. And so he kicks them out saying, this is my father's house. How could you do this? And by this point now, the religious leaders are starting to really be concerned about him to the place where they're beginning to, to think about his death. 
Uh, the next day, which is Tuesday, he has this intense discussion once again with the Jewish leaders, and he, he makes them look really bad in the discussion, only because they, they don't know what they're talking about, and they're embarrassed, and by this day on Tuesday, they plan to kill Jesus. And they find one of his 12, one of his 12 closest friends, a guy named Judas, and they offer Judas 30 pieces of silver if Judas will turn Jesus over to them. And in an unthinkable act of betrayal, I mean, this has got to be the worst, right? He says, yeah, I'll do that. One of his 12 closest friends says, I will betray my friend to you for 30 pieces of silver. He ends up regretting that, committing suicide. But in the moment, he says, yeah, he'll do it. And so on Wednesday, it's really interesting. Like a calm before a storm, everything goes silent on Wednesday. And there is no activity. It is just quiet. And then by Thursday, things begin to ramp up. Now, Thursday was for their one time in the year. This was a big celebration for them. This is a day called Passover. And even if you haven't read the Bible or uh, been in church much, you, you maybe have heard of the Passover. This is a day that commemorates a day in Hebrew history, Israelite history, where God brings his people, the Israelites, out of cruel bondage and 400 years. Think about this. 400 years, they've been enslaved to another country, Egypt. And they have been put to hard work. And even their place of worship has been not even non-existent. And after 400 years, God says, I'm going to bring you out. He uses a guy named Moses to do this. And in each one of what we, we, we call the plagues, God is demonstrating his power, his authority over the gods of the Egyptians. And the final one is life itself. And so God says, I'm going to send an angel of death to pass over the land. And when he passes over the land, he will kill the firstborn of everybody in the land unless, unless you take a lamb, an innocent, blameless lamb, and you slaughter it. And you take that lamb's life in place of your life. And you take the blood of that lamb, which was representative of life. Some of, some of this, I know it, it sounds crazy, but they totally understood it. One of the things that the, the Israelites understood was that life was synonymous with blood, which is why in their, their law, they don't drink blood, they don't eat food mixed with blood, they don't do that, because that is life. And so they were to take the life and the blood of the animal, put it over the doorpost, and when the angel of death came, it would pass over every house that had the blood of the lamb over the doorpost. Now this is totally pointing to something that God's eventual Savior will do. God's eventual Savior will come and he will give his life in place of those who deserve judgment. And it is his blood or his life that will allow God's judgment to pass over. And so this event is pointing to a future bigger event. And when they celebrate this meal together, Jesus and his 12 followers, Jesus takes the two elements of this meal. This is what is known as the Lord's Supper or communion now. We call it communion, the Lord's Supper. There's a piece of bread and there's a cup of juice or wine. And the bread it describes the animal's life that was broken. And then the blood is the life that was poured out. And in that, the angel of death passes over. And what was always representative of this lamb that provided safe passage from Egypt to Israelites' land, Jesus says, this blood and this cup now are no longer just the lamb. This is me. This is my body. This is what I'm going to do for you. So I, I, I am getting, you know, we, we, have the, we have the benefit of, like, knowledge now, right? We have the Bible, so we, we know these things. We know how the story ends, if you've ever read it. They didn't. I don't, I don't think they really understood what was going on. I think they thought that this was a little bit strange and, and actually hard to fathom. This is something that Moses had given them that they had celebrated all these years. Now Jesus says, when you take this meal, you're not longer taking it to commemorate that. You're taking it to commemorate me and my body, and my blood. And so into this night, Jesus goes and takes his followers into the Garden of Gethsemane, and he has this intense prayer moment because he knows now at this point as he thinks about what he is actually going to do, his purpose 
and the pain that he's going to suffer in fulfilling God's purpose for him, he ex experiences incredible stress and anguish. In fact, it is so stressful for him because he knows not only the physical pain, but the spiritual pain of being abandoned by his heavenly father and experiencing the, the full torment of hell, as we talked about last week, that he begins to, in his duress, he sweats blood. It is, it is an actual physical condition that some people do experience. Very rarely, though, because it, it requires intense stress. So much stress that the capillaries of the blood vessels actually open up, and the blood comes out and mingles with the sweat. And so when the person sweats, sweat and blood come out. And this is what Jesus is experiencing in this moment. It's called hematohydrosis. He is sweating blood. And he's faced with, do I continue in this thing and trust God? Or do I say, you know what, I've done enough and gone far enough. And he perseveres and he continues to obey God. And during the night, he's arrested. During the night, Judas does come and betray him. And during the night, he is taken away. And then throughout the night and into Friday morning, he goes through six trials that are total, total fake news trials. I mean, there's nothing substantial in anything he's accused of by the Romans or by the Israelites. And at the end, this guy named Pontius Pilate, who was conducting the whole thing, looks at Jesus and brings him out and says, Honestly, I don't see anything guilty about him. I mean, maybe he's broken some of your law, but he's not broken our law to the point where he deserves death. And he is trying to free Jesus because he knows that he's an innocent man. And so he, he decides that he will take him and go basically have him beaten, which is called scourged. He would have him whipped. According to Roman law, they couldn't do it more than 40 times, so he has it done 39 times in, in such a way that, and this is so gross and unthinkable. I mean, his flesh is literally hanging off of his body. He doesn't look like a man anymore. He looks like a side of, you know, beef. And he's hoping that they will be satisfied enough with that kind of torment and just let him go already. And he has this opportunity to, to release him because on this day, which is the Passover, there is this special provision in their law. They can release one prisoner, and there's two. One of them is Jesus, who he's already decided is innocent, and then the other guy is a, name, a guy named Barabbas, who is an insurrectionist, who has caused an insurrection against the Romans. And so he thinks for sure now they're satisfied. He's bloody. He's beaten. I, you know, I demonstrated, okay, I, I took him seriously. I punished him. And he says, who do you want me to release? Jesus, who's innocent, or Barabbas, the insurrectionist. And to his surprise, they call for Jesus. Crucify him, man. We, no, 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 no. We want Jesus. They were so jealous of him and so threatened by him that they wanted him killed. And so he lets Barabbas go, and he goes through with the unthinkable, an innocent man being crucified. Jesus has to carry his, his own cross all the way up to the place where he's going to be crucified. And uh, I really, I, I don't know if I, I appreciate this, but I appreciate the humanity of Jesus. Can you imagine? I mean, you're up all night long. You've just had a moment with God where it is so stressful. You're sweating blood. They come, and they beat you all through the night. You're whipped, and they tear the flesh off you. You had no sleep. You're physically tired. But he has to carry his, I mean, his death instrument all the way up to the place where he's going to die. And at a certain point, he just gives out. He can't do it anymore. And he falls down. And I'm, so, I'm, I'm really glad that he did that. I mean, you ever have those times in your life where it's just like, I don't know if I can go on anymore. And God doesn't just leave him there alone. God actually, they, they enlist somebody to carry the cross the rest of the way for him. And then he gets up to the place where he's going to be crucified and they hammer his wrists or his hands to a cross and his feet to a cross. Uh, typically, people died of asphyxiation. I mean, this, this wasn't just death. This was meant to be the most horrific kind of death. It was the Romans' way of saying, if you cross us, this is what we'll do for you. And so they displayed him on the most prominent place, the hill coming into the city. And Jesus, along with two other thieves, is being put to death in this manner. And the Romans, again, expressing their superiority. If you cross us, we do this to you. Nobody is greater than Caesar. Nobody is greater than Rome. And Jesus, as he's taking his last breaths on the cross, he's hanging there for six hours from 9 o'clock 
to about three o'clock, and it is complete darkness now. The sixth thing he says, and this is what I want to look at today, the sixth thing he says is in John chapter 19, and he's struggling for a breath so that he can say this. And he says this, later knowing that everything had now been finished. Everything that Jesus had been sent to do, everything that he, by the Father, was told was part of his purpose, the prophecy, the perfect life, at this point the suffering and death had been finished. And so that the scripture would be fulfilled, he said, I am thirsty. And a jar of wine vinegar was there, so he soaked a sponge, so they soaked a sponge in it. They put the sponge on a stalk, and he took a drink of it. He took a, a sip of it. And th- this, wasn't, this wasn't a sedative. This was for him. This is basically the, the, the stuff the Romans were drinking. I don't know if they were drinking out of a box or what. But this is stuff the Romans were drinking at the foot of the cross. They put it up to Jesus' mouth, and he gets a drink because his throat, can you imagine? I mean, he's thirsty now. You ever been to that place where you're so thirsty and parched you can barely speak? Kind of like I am right, right about now, like halfway through. Jesus needs a drink because what he's about to say has incredible significance when we're in our moment of pain. And Jesus takes a drink so that he can get these words out. When he had received the drink, he says the sixth thing he says on the cross, it is finished. And he says it obviously loud enough so that the person standing there could record this. This is John who was actually there witnessing this whole thing. Here is this. It is finished And then with that, he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. It is finished. It is finished. And this is not this is not a cry of defeat. This is not a a comment of man. I'm I'm just tapping out of this thing. When when our family first first moved here, uh, we went to Sandy Beach because it's a famous beach and it is a beautiful beach when you're sitting on the sand. And I went in the water and was somebody asked me, can, can you hold my bodyboard for me? And so I'm like, sure, I'll hold your bodyboard for you. That's the stupidest thing I ever did. So I'm sitting in the shore break, and it wasn't a big day, maybe three or four, and a three-foot swell picked me up because I was holding somebody's bodyboard and took me over the falls backwards. And I thought, it is finished. <laughs> I am finished. But that's not what Jesus is saying here. He's not saying it's over. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't. I failed. I can't finish. This is actually a cry of victory. This is a cry of, of triumph. You know, if, if he'd been crucified at Diamond Head, he'd have said, Jehu! Because this was him declaring victory, that he had accomplished everything, completed everything that the Father had sent him to do. Everything. And the word in the Greek, for those of you who would like to know, it is a word, tetelestai, tetelestai. And it's the same word that somebody who is in the business world or in the financial world uses when a debt has been paid in full. When a debt had been paid in full in the ancient world, they would stamp it, tetelestai, it is paid in full, it is finished. It is the same word that a builder would use. When a builder builds a home and finishes all the finishing work and everything is all done and they take the keys and they hand it to the new owner and the builder would say, Tetelestai, it is complete. It is completely done according to the blueprint. Everything that was supposed to be done is done. Complete. It is the same word that an artist would use when, when, when she looks at her, her work of art and realizes that there's nothing else that can be added to her work of art. It is exactly what she wants. There is no, Anything added will only mess up what I've done. It is totally finished and nothing can be added. It's probably what Leonardo da Vinci thought, or maybe not, when he looked at Mona Lisa. Mona Lisa has got to be one of the most... Uh, talked about and widely known and, and studied pieces of art, right? I mean, even the common person who doesn't know anything about the artistic world knows probably that picture. And, and, and from our vantage point in history, we go, regardless of whether you think she should have smiled more or whatever he was going through or whoever that was, that thing is done and it's a masterpiece. And if you try and add anything to the masterpiece, you only mess it up, right? 
Some people, however, don't believe this. And so makeup artists in New York decided, you know what, I think Mona Lisa needs a little upgrade. And some people thought that was cool, but people who viewed that as a masterpiece said, why would you add anything to his finished work? You just messed up the masterpiece. Now, I, I would have done this because we live in a selfie, ducky face world. <laughs> that makes more sense to me, right? Mona Lisa, 2018, that's kind of maybe what she would look. But... It's the word the artist uses when they look at their art and they say, it's finished. There's nothing more that you can add to it. It's also the word that the high priest would use on the Day of Atonement when they were doing sacrifices. And the sacrifices were finished. And he didn't want them to bring any more sacrifices because everything that needed to be offered was offered. And he would say, no more sacrifices to Telestai. It is finished. Sacrifices are totally done. It is finished. So what I want to do this morning is Jesus, he makes this proclamation that everything is done, it's accomplished. But what is he talking about? What is finished? In this moment, what is Jesus talking about? And, and this story and God's plan starts thousands of years and has been thousands of years in the making because there was a time when a man and a woman lived in great relationship with God, and there was absolutely, think about this, there was no fear, there was no guilt, there was no shame. I mean, it, it was so open and intimate that Adam would come to the door when God knocked, and he would open the door wide open and see his friend, and he didn't have any clothes on. I mean, that's pretty intimate, right? That's pretty intimate. That's how it was back then. There was no fear and no guilt. But something changed all of that. Something changed all of that. And it wasn't God that changed all of that. It was sin that changed all of that. And I, I don't know what you think about sin or, or whether it exists. But we all know and feel at times that something is not right with us and that something is not right in our world, right? When we look at our world, don't you ever go like, yeah, I know guns and, 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 and all that, but something caused somebody to pick up a gun and do that. What in the world could do that? There is something in our world and in us that causes evil in the world that we live in. And for Adam and Eve, it caused a disconnect with God. The sin causes a disconnect with God. And whether you call it sin or whatever you might call it, we all know that things are not right here. And in our world at times, things are not right. And it's not just the things that we do. It's not just the things that we do. It's who we are that is not right. Because the things that we do just come from who we are. Now, let me explain this. Because I have this dog, and I, I always show pictures of her unflattering ones. Let me just, this is, <laughs> this is her in all of her four-pound aggressiveness this is presley and presley will bark at anything that moves or threatens her position she barks and barks all day long but barking does not make presley a dog presley barks because she is a dog it is her nature of a dog that leads her to bark. And you and I are not sinners because we sin. We sin because we are sinners. It is our nature to do what is evil. That's why laws, as good as they are, will never constrain what is inside of here. We may have the most sophisticated, and I love living in the United States, but the most sophisticated laws will not change or be able to corral the evil that exists in here and that causes a disconnection with God because we have a sinful nature. And when Adam and Eve chose to disobey God and when Adam and Eve chose to call the shots of their own life, they opened the door for sin and death and evil and destruction to influence all of humankind. And now everything we touch, as good as it may be, is tainted with the evil that exists inside of us. And God, however, didn't want to leave us in that condition. Thank God. He planned to destroy evil. 
Now, he, here's the real dilemma for me and for us, because my kids ask me about this all the time. Then why doesn't he just do it? Why, why, why does he just not get rid of it already? Now, think about this. Where does evil exist? Does it exist out there or in here? It's not just them over there. It's us over here. So as much as we want God to just, you know, show his judgment and justice towards evil, which he will do one day, he couldn't do that because he would destroy all of us in the process because we're the ones who actually carry it. And so how can God at at one time be just and judge evil for what it is, and yet on the other hand, loving and graceful? And so he, he decides, though, that when Adam and Eve do this, that there will come a day where he will destroy all evil. In Genesis 3, it says this to describe it. He will crush, talking about Satan, he will crush Satan's head. Satan is the one who tempted Adam and Eve to evil. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. So when this day comes and God destroys evil, he's going to send somebody who will crush the head of the serpent. And in that act of destroying evil, he will himself receive a blow of death. So he's painting a picture of this person that will eventually come. He will conquer evil, but evil will conquer him so that he can conquer evil. And you can imagine the people who first heard this, it didn't make sense to them. Well, how is he going to destroy evil if he himself is destroyed? But that's God's plan. This plan has been happening for thousands of years, and God came to a man named Abraham, and he said, Abraham, this one who will crush Satan's head, he will come from your direct line, from your family. And then he came to a guy named Moses, and he said, Moses, he will come, and he will be a great prophet just like you, even greater than you. And then he appeared to a man named David, and he said, David, he will be a king just like you, and his kingdom will never, ever end. It will be an eternal kingdom. David, you will die, but his kingdom will never end because he will never, ever die. And then it got more specific. And then he said, he will be born in Bethlehem, and he will be born from a young lady who has never had sexual relations with a man. She will be a virgin. And then he will come and he will ride into Jerusalem with celebration on a donkey's back. And he will suffer and he will be betrayed. He will eventually die on a cross and he will be tormented and abused. And he won't even look like a man anymore. And he will do all this to become a sacrifice in your place. To pay the price for your sins. Now we totally don't get that. We don't. Because animal sacrifice is weird, right? Nod your head, because if not, I'm calling 911 on you. (laughs) Animal sacrifice, it it just doesn't make sense. You and I did not grow up with it. But to the Israelites, it totally makes sense. To the Israelites, the sacrifice of an animal in their place was the most powerful picture of God's justice and his mercy, of his loving kindness and of his grace. The most powerful picture. Because here's what they know that we, we don't know. God made a provision allowing them to take an innocent animal as a substitute for them. They deserved judgment. They deserved death because of their sins. But God says, I will allow you to get an animal who is innocent and blameless. And in substitution, that animal will substitute its life for your life. And the the Bible word for this is atone. The animal's life and blood will atone for your sin. It will cover over your debt. You have a debt with me. You owe me because of your sin. But I will allow the animal to pay the price for you. That's what they understood. In fact, they did sacrifices daily for their own sins, and then annually they had this thing called the Day of Atonement. Now, I don't know about you, but if I had to sacrifice an animal for every time I sinned, dude, I I would, I would, there's not enough animals to be able to actually help Sean. I mean me. There's not enough animals... Right, and so so in in the in the in the the ritual in the symbolic uh, sacrifice, they would lay their hands on the animal, imputing or putting their sin onto the innocent animal, and so they would list all of their sins. Now, come on, how long would it take for you to list all of your sins on an innocent animal? At least 
a week, right? I mean, it would take a long time. And then there were two animals that were sacrificed on the Day of Atonement, two goats that were sacrificed. One of them, they would lay and they would say all their sins, and then they would send the goat into the wilderness. That goat is called the scapegoat. That's where we get the term scapegoat. It takes the blame that belongs to me. So when somebody's a scapegoat, you're putting your blame on them. And so they put, we put our blame, the blame of our sin, on the scapegoat and send it into the wilderness. The other animal was slaughtered in our place. The other animal's blood was shed for the forgiveness of our sins so that God could look at our lives and it would be covered by the blood of that innocent animal or atoned for our sin. And so can you imagine what it would be like to grow up in a family where this was just the way that things are? How honestly horrific it would be to be the child of a family member and during the time of sacrifice and the, and the lamb that you have grown up with and that you've nurtured is now one year old and at the age where it is able to become a sacrifice and that lamb has a name presley or something like that <laughs> i'm kidding that lamb that you fed that you nurtured that was the family pet, that was so protected because it needed to be this innocent, blameless lamb, is now taken. Daddy, why, is, why are they taking the lamb to the temple? And, and here's why. Because of our sins. The lamb hasn't done anything wrong, but we have. And in this moment is this beautiful and horrific picture of this innocent lamb being slaughtered because of us. And the child grows up knowing that there are consequences for my sin. My sin produces death and destruction, not just to me, but to others who don't even deserve it. And as this lamb is being slaughtered, like on the Day of Atonement, there are these two emotions that are being experienced. One of them is just gratitude because this innocent lamb is being substituted in my place. The other is this pain, knowing that it's my sin that caused that innocent lamb to have to experience that. But every year they would have to do these sacrifices because as good as the sacrifices were in the moment to cover over our sin and to create a reconnection with God, it wasn't good enough to wash away our sin, to change our lives. And so God said, part of his plan was, there will come a day when I will send. And this is how he described the sending of this, this lamb in Isaiah. He says this. He was despised and he was rejected by mankind. He was a man of suffering. This is 700 years before Jesus is born. God talks about his provision. Not just a lamb or an animal, but a perfect, sinless, blameless human being who would die in our place, pay the price for our sins, not his own, but our sins. And this is how Isaiah describes him 700 years beforehand. I think this is so amazing. He was despised and rejected by mankind. He was a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Surely he took our pain and he bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. So as the people were looking at all of this happening, they were thinking, surely he's receiving something that he deserved. He must have done something to deserve that. And God is saying he did nothing to deserve that. He's actually experiencing something he doesn't deserve for us. But he was pierced for our transgression. Remember, his hands and his feet were pierced. Even his side was pierced. He was crushed for our iniquities. Punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. By what he is suffering right now, you and I will be reconnected with God and not just healed physically, but, but even the bigger and the more invisible pain that we all experience in this disconnection is our soul dies. And Isaiah is saying God will bring forth healing, not just physically, but in your soul, God will bring forth healing as he receives this punishment. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way and the Lord has laid the iniquity of us all on him. Yet it was the Lord's will. This was God's purpose, was to crush him with the weight of our sin and to cause him to suffer. 
after he has suffered, he will see the light of life. So suffering and death were not the end. After he had suffered, he would see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. And that word iniquities is, is another word to describe our sin. He will bear our sin. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life to death. He was numbered with the transgressors, but he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. And in this moment, Jesus, as he dies on the cross, he is giving an update on God's plan. And and John the Baptist now kind of fast forward to Jesus' life. John the Baptist was receiving a lot of attention and they were all asking him, are you the one? Are you the one who's going to come and fulfill all the things that have been spoken about, the one who would come and crush Satan's head? And John says, it's not me. And then Jesus walks by and John points to him and he says, that's the, and look at this, it's really interesting, that's the Lamb of God. That is the one, that is God's offering On our behalf, he's the one, and he's going to die because he will take away the sin of the world. And in this moment, Jesus is on the cross, and he says, Tetelestai, it's finished. Satan's head is now crushed. I've suffered, I paid the price, I fulfilled the prophecy. Satan's head is now crushed. Everything that withstood us coming to God is no longer standing in the way. Hell has been conquered. Death has been defeated. I have suffered for sin. It is totally over. It is done. And there's nothing now that anybody can add to what I've done. It is completely finished. So what is finished? Prophecy is finished. Perfect life that had to be lived was finished. At this moment, suffering on the cross was finished. The one who came to proclaim the good news is now dying. His life is finished. And he's giving his life as a sacrifice for our sins. It is completely finished. Complete, paid in full. There is nothing else we can add. No more sacrifices necessary. It is completely done. Man, those are the Best three words ever. Except when you're eating ice cream and you get to the bottom there. Jesus says it is finished. And I think the really interesting thing about us is even though we may know that, we don't really live like we believe that. We, we, because, and, it, and it's because of our guilt and it's because we know what we did yesterday and we know what's inside of us and we know the sin, and so we feel like we've got to bring something. I mean, I, I, I know it's finished, but I feel like I've got to bring something, so we, we compensate by trying harder. We do more, we pray more, I'll serve more, I'll go on a mission trip, I'll stop drinking so much coffee, I'll, I'll just stop drinking so much. We, just, we do all these things to bargain, and Jesus wanted it to be so clear. It is finished. You cannot bring anything that will cause God to love you more, forgive you more, or get rid of your sin. Only Jesus' sacrifice on a cross can do that for you and I. That's the only thing that can make us clean. It is completely finished. And knowing that gives us the strength to finish what you have been created for. Jesus finished, he persevered, he obeyed God to the end. And God wants you to do the same thing. Not to earn anything, but because you've been gratefully recipient or received what God has done for you and I. God, it is finished, but our lives are not over. Jesus was finished, but his life was not over. In fact, next Sunday we talk about what was not over. Even though Jesus gave his life on the cross on this, this Friday, we call it Good Friday, it's good for us, wasn't good for him. He gave his life on the cross. It was finished, but it wasn't over. 
And on Easter, we celebrate why it wasn't over. In fact, this Easter, I want to encourage you, we're going to have a great time not only celebrating what Jesus did, but celebrating through the life of somebody uh, as an example of how God not only raised Jesus, but because he raised Jesus, he can raise you and I. And so we have a friend named Lenny who uh, spent, uh, honestly, a good, a good little stint of his life in jail. He's one of those kind of people you look at and you go, what can God do with somebody who's wasted that much of their life? Even though you may feel finished, God says it's not over. And Easter is a celebration of that moment where it's not over, even though Jesus is finished. And you're not finished. God has work for you to do. And it is the power of what Jesus did on that cross. He lived the perfect life that we should have lived. He died in our place, the death that we deserve to die. And the reason why he did that is because he loves you. The reason why he allowed his son to go through that is because he loves him. Some of you this morning, you're in that place of pain. You're having a difficult day or a difficult season. Or some of you go, man, I just told my whole life has been difficult. I don't know exactly what's happening in it, but I am assured of this, that no matter who caused it or whatever brought it on, that God is with us in our most difficult days. And he is accomplishing his purpose in those days. And that as much as we're tempted to think, like they were tempted to think about Jesus, you must have done something to deserve this. He loves you no matter what you're going through, just like he loved his son when he was being punished and receiving the full weight of justice and wrath. And he was with him in the midst of it. God loves you, and God is with you in the midst of it. And Jesus' perseverance and obedience, even to the end, gives us the strength and the courage to believe that, God, you have a purpose in my pain and that you love me and you will be with me until I'm able to say, God, whatever I can do to give you glory, it is finished. Jesus, it is finished. I have lived my life in a way that gives you ultimate glory, even if that meant going through this. It is finished. I want to pray this morning with you as our worship team comes and joins me. And I want to pray for some of you this morning who...